Hello and welcome back to another Aspects of Archaeology. Today we're going to be examining a very specific question and that is sexing skeletons. That is to say identifying whether a skeleton is uh, a male or a female skeleton. Now this question is obviously crucial on archaeological excavations, for example for identifying population statistics and, and talking about the ways in which a culture is shaped and formed and its treatment of male and female bodies. Uh, but also this question actually is surprisingly difficult to answer with absolute certainty and we'll get into that in the course of this video. But really the, the first problem is that typically, typically, the differences between male and female bodies are identified using well, squidgy and hairy bits. Bits that don't normally survive in the grave. For example, a nice beard. And, uh, well, that can be problematic. With living bodies, it is often fairly straightforward to spot typical male and female attributes. This sexual dimorphism, the physical differences between men and women, is, on the one hand, simply a requirement for sexual reproduction. But on the other hand, the human body has been shaped by hundreds of thousands of years of our response to the differences between men and women. And so partly male and female bodies are what they are because of the roles that people have assigned to them. Now it's worth noting that I'm not talking about gender roles. That's something for another video. And indeed, globally, there's a great deal of variation about what society and social norms consider to be male and female, masculine and feminine attributes. I also want to acknowledge that there are people who are born ambiguous, shall we say. All of this is a level of complexity and specificity which archaeologists are rarely able to identify or tackle. You see, if we're really, really lucky, a body might fall into something like a peat bog and be exquisitely well preserved. This keeps the squidgy bits and the hairy bits intact, meaning we can talk more confidently about the sex of an individual and perhaps even their place in society. This is particularly true of children, as their skeletons are so similar before they reach puberty. And so, when archaeologists attempt to identify the sex of a body, we do fall back on a simple binary state, male-female, essentially in the reproductive sense. Then, if we're lucky, we can try to understand what that body might have meant in the society that it came from. However, archaeologists do not typically deal with whole preserved bodies. Rather, archaeologists typically find skeletons in the grave, and skeletons is all we have to go on. So, we attempt to identify the binary male-female using the bones that are left behind. So, typically, archaeologists are left with bones in the ground, and they want to identify whether these bones are male or female. This is where the specialism of osteoarchaeology, or osteoarchaeologists themselves, bone specialists, step in and can offer hints and tips at identifying skeletons based on certain diagnostic elements. Now, uh, if you're really lucky, you may have a complete skeleton, and from there, there are certain parts of the skeleton that can be examined to give you the best guess possible as to whether or not this individual was male or female. So, we have a skeleton, and we want to sex it. We want to know whether it's male or female. The simplest place to start is to examine the overall state of the skeleton, especially compared to other skeletons in the same or a similar population. Is this skeleton a tall skeleton for its population, or is it fairly short? Is it very robust and well-built with thick bones, or is it what we call more gracile, with slightly thinner bones and a slightly lighter bone structure? These are the simplest diagnostics of male and female skeletal attributes. The next thing to examine, again, if you're lucky enough to have a complete skeleton, is the hip bone. Because females can give birth and males cannot, the hip bones are different. On the male pelvis, the so-called pubic arch is 90 degrees or less, an acute angle, whereas on the female pelvis, the pubic arch is much more a gentle curve. The female pelvis is generally wider, with the pelvic inlet, the space in the middle, being more circular than in the male skeleton, 
In fact, in the male skeleton, I've heard the space for the pelvic inlet described as being Mickey Mouse shaped. This is useful to remember. After all, Mickey is a boy. And so in this image, it is the pelvis on the left, which is the male pelvis. Finally, the acetabulum, or the ball socket, which secures the head of the femur, or leg bone, is usually larger in males than it is in females. Returning to our skeleton, the next best place to look, if you're lucky enough to recover one, is the skull. The skull can be extremely useful when trying to sex a skeleton, and this makes perfect sense. After all, when many think of male or female attributes, they go to extremes. A woman is extremely beautiful, a man is extremely handsome, and these features are directly informed by the skull beneath the skin. In males, for example, the chin tends to be squarer and less rounded. It's also more pointy than in females. Females tend to have a wider gonial flare. That's the extent to which it flares outwards, away from the skull. Male foreheads tend to slant backwards, away from the eyes, whereas female foreheads are more rounded. Males tend to have prominent brow ridges, whereas females do not. And finally, the mastoid process, a bone at the base of the skull behind the ear where the neck muscles attach, is much more robust and pronounced in males compared to females. And that really is the key. These are comparative features in relation to males and females within the same population. Anthropological studies have shown that it's quite difficult to determine sex from an unknown population. So comparison is crucial. So those are some of the features and, and aspects of a skeleton that can be examined to try and determine whether it's male or female. Though, as is hopefully clear from the description, it's not always an exact science. There is variation both within populations, from one population to another, and frankly from one individual to another. And some of the best case studies come from, uh, well, a re-examination of the material. First, we go to the Gower Peninsula in South Wales and Paviland Cave. It was here in 1823 that William Buckland, a geologist from Oxford University, first explored a cave which contained the burial of a human being. There were a few bones remaining, and what did remain was covered with a reddish powder. The skeleton was accompanied by jewellery, some of which was made from what he assumed was elephant ivory, but was in fact ivory from a mammoth. Buckland was very much a man of his time and a fan of the Romans. He concluded that these bones were from a Roman prostitute and that the ochre residue staining the bones red were in fact the remnants of makeup or possibly even hair dye, something which the Roman prostitutes were known to wear rather conspicuously. 140 years later, however, the bones were radiocarbon dated in the 1960s and shown to come from around 18,000 years ago. Subsequent tests put the bones back to around 29,000 years ago. What's more, a reassessment of the bone showed that this was not a lady. This was in fact a male skeleton. Despite Buckley's assumptions, this was a man and anything but a Roman prostitute. Our second case study involves an excavation I was on around 12 years ago. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Just before I went to university, I attended an excavation at a place called Poulton Abbey, not too far from the Welsh-English border and headed up by archaeologist Mike Emery, pictured here on the right. It was on this site that I confirmed to myself that I really wanted to be an archaeologist, and I even got to excavate my first skeleton. I've made a video about this long ago, but a key problem with the skeleton was the fact that we could not know whether it was male or female before I had to leave the site. The primary reason was the skeleton was cut in half, and having only half the skeleton made it very difficult to, uh, to get a full sense of its dimensions, and the skull was firmly buried in the ground still. At the time it was frustrating, but it was nonetheless a lesson that stuck with me. Our third case study comes from Tarquinia in Italy, 
where in 2013 archaeologists excitedly announced the discovery of an Etruscan prince. He was laid out on a platform with lavish grave goods, including a symbol of his power, a spear. However, closer analysis revealed that this prince was in fact a princess, and his wife was in fact a man. Soon the interpretation shifted away from a powerful symbol to more of a symbol of unity between the woman and her husband. Here, sexing the skeleton was indeed difficult, but a little bit like William Buckley in the 19th century, an assumption was made, possibly based on a modern bias. So we start with a deceptively simple question, male or female, tell me what this skeleton is. Uh, and hopefully this video and those case studies have really highlighted that the answer can be surprisingly difficult to tie down. Uh, considering that the simplicity of the question, the answer is complicated. And this is because there are so many variables involved. For a start, you can't really easily tell the difference between boys and girls before what we call sexual dimorphism really kicks in, before essentially puberty. Boys and girls have very similar skeletons. Um, when they grow up, some women have more masculine traits in their skeleton, and some men have more gracile female traits in their skeletons. And then we have the, the, the variation of, of personal interpretation. Uh, the specialist and their experience really actually uh, plays a big role in what the skeleton will be interpreted as. Not only might uh, a specialist miss certain traits of the skeleton, but also actually the artifact that the skeleton is found with. For example, in the case uh, of, of the Etruscan princess. Um, it really depends on what you think on what, and what you're, what you're assuming the skeleton will be based on how and where you found it. Now this is actually also where we start to sort of to, to, to wander into the question of gender and, uh, and gender is completely different from sex. Gender is a cultural construct and in some societies there's, there's two genders, in some societies there's, there's three, some societies there's, there's multiple genders. That is a whole other issue. How, you, how society treats the body, how the body is viewed by others and how a person wants their body to be considered is separate from the, this question of sexing a skeleton. But even, as I say, sexing a skeleton is complicated enough. So we'll, we'll put gender over there for now. <laughs> and we'll, and uh, hopefully this video has been useful in just helping you to think about some of these questions when it comes to sexing a skeleton. Boy, girl, very hard to tell. Male, female, mm, you can tell, but there are some variables. And absolute certainty, well, you have to be, uh, in many cases, fairly brave to be totally certain about a skeleton. That said, though, there are some skeletons which are definitely very, you know, like for example, my, my, I've got some prominent brow ridges. <laughs> I might be part Neanderthal, who knows. Anyway, guys, hopefully this has been interesting and or useful. Please do comment below. Please do uh, discuss any, any, any related issues below. And as ever, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.